Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this student PhD edition of Medicine 4.0, When New Technologies Work with AI, a IMS Distinguished Lecturer webinar hosted by Professor Eros Passero. Quickly, before we begin, I'm going to give um, a brief overview of the society and an introduction to Dr. Passero, and then he will get started with his presentation. The Instrumentation and Measurement Society field of interest is the science, technology, and application of instrumentation and measurement. We would like to invite you to join IMS. Um, the IMS Society mission statement is to provide the most comprehensive and high quality services to our members and related professionals. So that's our goal and intention and in everything we host as a society. Um, Professor Eros Passero will be giving our presentation today. He's a professor of electronics at Politecnico of Turin in Italy. He's the president of SIREN, the Italian Society for Neural Networks. He holds six international patents, two of which were the first silicone European neurons and synapses together at Texas Instruments and has authored more than 100 international publications. We're so thankful to have Dr. Passero here to speak with us today. And um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to him to present. So I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. Can I start? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Madison. Uh, good morning to everybody in the United States and good afternoon for uh, European students. And uh, today's lesson, I will share my screen now. Okay, comes from a lesson uh, for uh, PhD bioengineers two years ago. It was uh, four hours long, but uh, don't worry, I cut uh, to just one hour and nothing more and I simplified some concepts. So uh, let me start with the representation, if I am able to find. Okay. Uh, Today's goal is just to introduce uh, the concept of medicine 4.0, but uh, today is quite important, uh, thanks to COVID, but not only. So we will see together a lot of things dealing with medicine for the uh, topics uh, telemedicine and telehealth uh, abused words today and uh, i will try to show you what i think about the meaning of telemedicine and telehealth and uh, the meaning of uh, medicine 4.0 uh, in comparison with the well-known industry 4.0 and just a fast review of new wearable devices that are uh, the, the only possibility to really have uh, uh, medicine, uh, telemedicine and so on. I will show you some examples and uh, I will profit uh, to, to spend the three slides uh, about the real meaning of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning because uh, these tools today are important all over the world for every application, but also for telemedicine. Uh, we have a lot of research in this field and you find a lot of application. And uh, last but not the least, I'm a distinguished lecturer of IEEE Instrumentation and Measurement Society. So the question can be why Instrumentation and Measurement Society would consider the artificial intelligence approach to measurement. Okay, we will discuss about this. Okay, now start with telemedicine and telehealth. Uh, telehealth or e-health, uh, according to HRS agency, uh, is a difficult concept uh, because uh, uh, you can find uh, more than 50 definitions of telehealth in literature and everybody thinks uh, to have a good definition, but it's not so easy. I think that we can distinguish between the telehealth and the telemedicine in this way. 
Telehealth is the application of technologies to help patients to manage their own need illness. Uh, so uh, telehealth is not uh, a device, it's a system. It's a system where uh, patients uh, can be monitoring in the remote and we can have a different approach to follow patients' health. Telemedicine. Uh, to apply telehealth, we need uh, technologies uh, because uh, I will show you uh, in some countries what does it mean as uh, uh, telemedicine. We, knew, we need special devices to be able to remote monitor, to uh, uh, video telephone, to assist remote patients, uh, uh, to check vital signs and so on. So this is the real innovation, to give remote patients to be able to check his health, and this is telehealth, but to give him the possibility to send these signals to a remote physician, to a remote care center, and so on, we need telemedicine. I will try to be more clear. Uh, by the way, first question is why telemedicine? Uh, it seems that the main reason uh, is coming from the 50s. In the 50s, we had a baby boomer, and uh, today we have a lot of people aged more than 60 years. Okay, uh, my father is 95, and my mother is 92, and uh, they are still living uh, with some problems, ah, right? Some problems, this is a magic world. They have a lot of chronic disease. Uh, how can we follow this chronic disease? Moreover, people life expectancy is increased. If you have a look to 19 uh, uh, life expectancy, was 21 years less than today. Uh, okay, thanks to COVID in these last years, we have lost one year. Uh, by the way, uh, I hope that COVID will go. And uh, so life expectancy is increasing. Wellness uh, and um, a lot of details can be used to increase our life. Uh, you think, okay, uh, we have uh, more people with chronic disease, uh, we have uh, more medical doctors. Hmm. No, this is not true, because uh, unfortunately, the public cost for medical assistance is increasing. You have a more medical uh, <coughs> need uh, for chronic disease, but you have uh, no more medical doctors. So the solution is uh, to try to delocalize uh, services. We often have uh, uh, big hospitals in big cities, but a lot of people living far from the cities. And uh, okay, for serious disease, uh, hospitals are the only solution. But uh, for typical chronic disease, I will show you some examples. Uh, maybe, we can think to another concept to delocalize the services. COVID-19 was a clear example of this concept <coughs> because no physical contact is allowed between people when you have a COVID. And uh, uh, physician, patients, relatives must stay away from each other so the question is, how can a doctor visit a patient? Uh, my parents now have COVID and they have no symptoms, so they, they are okay, but they asked for a medical doctor visit and they didn't receive neither a mail. So some doctors maybe are thinking that COVID is traveling along mail, so this is the situation. So, uh, Real <laughs> serious question is how can a doctor this situation? <coughs> Come back to the concept of telemedicine. 
today uh, things are changing. Uh, ID and electronics are very effective and you have new opportunities for remote monitoring of human parameters. <coughs> we can think to have low cost devices distributed uh, all over the country and everybody is able to use these devices. This is the idea, okay? but unfortunately not the real situation. Uh, the, the, the main tool uh, that everybody has today is the smartphone. So we can think to have a generation of uh, remote electronic devices connected through internet and they can send important information dealing with important human diseases. Before COVID, but also today, you know that the main cause of death in the world <laughs> was cardiological problems. <coughs> uh, this is a really uh, big problem. And uh, so uh, atrial fibrillation often uh, are an important signs that you need help. But uh, it's difficult uh, to understand when you have uh, atrial fibrillation. So if you have uh, um, a problems in your chest, you can think to, to, to check it uh, with your hand, uh, to call a doctor. Doctor, what do you think? Oh, yeah, this can be serious. Call an ambulance. You call an ambulance, an ambulance will travel to you, will go to a hospital with you. Okay, half an hour, one hour. And if it was a serious problem, you are dead. So. Uh, the meaning is to have the possibility to check immediately if you have problems with your <coughs> electrocardiogram. So we need a different concept of electrocardiogram. Photoplatismography, uh, the green light that you find in modern fitness watches. Uh, okay, this is an application for fitness, but uh, you know that today uh, we use uh, uh, oximetry to understand the quantity of oxygen in our blood. For uh, the first phase of COVID, this was very important because uh, <coughs> saturation values below 90 uh, was very dangerous. So this is again a simple tool which can be shared with a care system to monitor your situation. But uh, <coughs> also without going uh, to big problems, uh, other problems can be investigated using uh, telemedicine. For example, we have a big experience uh, with phlebologists, uh, medical doctors, uh, to uh, control elder people with leg ulcer, a very common problem uh, in uh, all in elderly. And uh, usually they were requested to go to the medical doctors uh, every week, uh, just for a few minutes uh, to check the status of their ulcer. Okay, when uh, it was bad, it, it was okay to go to the hospital. But when uh, everything was okay, was regular, <laughs> maybe no. So I will show you uh, a possible solution. <coughs> This is very important. When you have in mind these new devices, these new devices must be simple because they can be used by elder people without caregivers. So smartphone sometimes is difficult also. Uh, I see my mother, 92, has a no problem with smartphone, WhatsApp, uh, everything. But my father, 95, as a problem also to push buttons. So the, the, the question is how can we build simple devices to be used by people who really need them? Okay, so <laughs> this is a general hypothetical situation, smartphone, the core of a lot of vital science. Um, the goal of electronic health and telemedicine together. 
to short hospital stay and home remote monitoring. This is important because after uh, surgery, usually uh, patients <laughs> were uh, obliged to stay in the hospital or just for, uh, for check. Uh, and uh, so uh, today we have a lot of problems with the, the beds available for patients. And in this way, if we have the possibility to check the status of the patients in remote, we can shorten the hospital stay. And the other, of course, home remote monitoring. Uh, I already spoke about COVID and other things. Uh, is it possible? Well, I will show you. Uh, for most uh, sensors, we only need <coughs> to measure voltages. And uh, I will show you <coughs> a traditional electrocardiogram where you need to remove dresses, place electrodes, and so on. If we can save all these steps, it can be good. <coughs> Another paper. In this period, we have a big international project with Israel and uh, Italy uh, dealing with electrocardiogram. Okay. Uh, the history of this electrocardiogram with a special disease, in our case, is a Brugada, and uh, are on paper. Okay, you know that today with electronic devices, <coughs> we can use uh, signals uh, to, to understand the meaning of some diseases. Unfortunately, all electrocardiograms that we have are paper. Okay, it's a waste, <coughs> but specifically, we need to transform papers in electronic signals. <coughs> Moreover, everybody knows that when you need to go to a medical doctor, to a care center, to a hospital, you have to do reservation, you need a time <laughs> for travel, so you have a lot of time lost. Uh, with uh, telemedicine, you only need to connect your smartphone and remote physicians can give a report. <coughs> and uh, for some diseases, you can also have a local self diagnosis. So if you have a caregiver, he can help you immediately without going to a hospital. So the goal is uh, to eliminate, not the doctors, but of course, uh, we need doctors, but unfortunately, we have a few number of doctors. So we want to cut off the unnecessary visit to the doctor's office, to a hospital. So sometimes a routine checkup can be conducted online. To be able to do this, uh, we have uh, <coughs> the requirement to have a suitable instrument which can be used at home. Okay, I <coughs> started with my uh, my talk speaking of medicine 4.0. What's the meaning? When I speak of industry 4.0, everybody is able because industry, wow, is a dominant word in the world. So we started to define industry 1.0 in the 1784 <coughs> with a steam power. 100 years after, Industry 2.0 with electrical energy. 100 af years after I go, again in 1969, Industry 3.0 when we had computers, automation, and electronics. Today, industry is increasing faster. So we speak of Industry 4.0, where you have uh, cyber physical systems, uh, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, networks, connecting machines. But for medicine, uh, medicine is just a bit slow. <coughs> so it's difficult to make of medicine one, two, three, four. Uh, I propose this. It's not the only, but uh, we can define the beginning of modern, of modern medicine, medicine 1.0, when Watson and Quick described the DNA structure. This was the first big evolution of medicine. In uh, 
medicine through Doctor Who, we were able to begin the sequences of the human genome where we can find the origin of diseases. You know that this week uh, the sequences was completed. So today we are able to understand everything about the DNA and to find the origin of all our disease. Medicinefree.o, oh wow, when both biologists and engineers decided to work together. <coughs> this was an important step. Those, uh, the two knowledge uh, were really important to find a new solution, new devices, new structures. And today, today modern medicine for dog is just like industry for dog for dot o. The process digitization, when uh, we have a possibility to have a communication and functioning in the health systems. This means that we have to change something. Medical doctors are not only doctors able to use a stethoscope to listen to your heartbeat and other things. We use uh, signals, digital signals. And here we need that the instrumentation and measurement society give a significant contribution. Okay, so as I already told you, the goals of Medicine for Do is a remote monitoring, remote diagnosis, the, the, the real goal is to prevent dangerous situation before they occur. And this means improving the quality of the health services and have a new technologies for smart sensor. <coughs> what is today telemedicine? I often find uh, advertisement about, okay, society X, Y, Z is offering you telemedicine. Oh, wow. But uh, really, telemedicine is a friend phone service where patients use their phone, WhatsApp maybe, or a special application to speak with a caregiver. It's important. I know that uh, elderly needs to have a contact with a human because sometimes they live far from cities. So it's not so bad to have this communication. But this is not telemedicine. Uh, the doctor is not able <coughs> to understand severe problems. Let me show you. Uh, I didn't tell you that in these days I had COVID. Uh, you can hear my cough. And uh, okay, I'm not serious, uh, ill, but uh, I'm not so good. And uh, Italian national uh, health system every day is checking me with telemedicine, I show. Uh, this is a mail where every day they ask me, uh, uh, do you have any difficulties? Are you able to breathe? Uh, do you have a uh, weakness and uh, so on? Okay, I can say everything I want. For example, if in Italy, you know that we have public systems helping uh, to stay at home, not working without losing your income. So if I'm not an honest man, I, every, every day I say, oh, I'm not so good. Oh, I have weakness, I have everything. And so I can stay at home one month. But uh, what is the control? But uh, this is the worst case. <coughs> they also think to have a control on my serious symptoms. So they ask me fever, saturation, and blood pressure. These are three important parameters. But they ask me to tell, uh, okay, it's incredible because uh, they suppose I have uh, tools uh, to measure these parameters. They suppose that I'm, I'm able to read these parameters and to send them. This is not good approach to telemedicine. We need this vital sign, these parameters, but we need devices able to measure and send <coughs> this information in a reliable way to medical doctors. This is telemedicine. This is useful. 
At the beginning of COVID, in Italy, they was uh, they were thinking to use uh, this uh, small uh, baggage uh, where uh, you can find the uh, electrocardiogram, uh, uh, oximetry, and the thermometer and other tools. Uh, in this way, a uh, doctor was able to go to patient's house to measure his vital parameters. Of course, uh, the doctor has to protect himself against the virus. So every time he has uh, to address and dress again with protections. And uh, <coughs> the, the maximum was uh, 10 patients per day. In Italy, we are uh, 65 million. And uh, it was high expensive. This small medical package <coughs> was uh, 20,000 euros, more or less $20,000. And so this was not a good approach. They, they tried to use it, but uh, <coughs> they were not able to use it. We need the new instruments. This is the solution. Oh, let me show you uh, just a small movie. I'm sorry, it's in Italian, but I will uh, comment in, uh, in English, of course. And uh, this was our first uh, electrocardiogram in 2015, so before Apple Watch, okay. Let me show you. Okay, you see here, this was our uh, watch. Uh, and this is a low cost smartphone with nothing more. And you see that uh, you only need to dress the, the, the watch. And uh, here you see the LED the flower lighting. And uh, <coughs> the ECZ app was able to be used with just one finger and the same finger pushed on the watch. Very simple. After 10 seconds, you have the ACZ on the smartphone. This is not important. If you are able to read it, it's okay. But if you're not able, it's not a problem. You push an envelope and the electrocardiogram will go to your medical doctor or to your <coughs> medical insurance, for example. We have a contract with the medical insurance. And uh, they had a similar tool uh, working on a laptop, you see, they received the electrocardiogram and they have a lot of possibilities. They were able to apply filter, to take measurements between uh, the meaningful waves of the electrocardiogram. Okay, this was a very useful tool. For example, we were requested by a, a, a big insurance company with uh, participants uh, in uh, uh, far ship, uh, just like Costa. Uh, and uh, in this way, they were able to receive electrocardiogram all over the world. This is uh, today's situation. Today's situation, you have to go to a medical studio or to a hospital <coughs> to undress, uh, to put uh, electrodes on your, your uh, breast and to measure the electrocardiogram. Oh, your question can be, but uh, you think that this is a good solution that you think to replace electrocardiogram with your watch? The answer is absolutely no. We need to still have 12 leads electrocardiogram to find most diseases related to heart. But very simple uh, <laughs> electrocardiogram on your wrist, very low cost, <coughs> are able to find, for example, atrial fibrillation. And this is a serious indication to be uh, checked immediately. And in this way, if you are in uh, your home, uh, in mountain, on the seaside, you are able to communicate immediately. And the, the cardiologist will say, okay, come here, come here, I think it's better. Or uh, don't worry, it's a parasitic atrial fibrillation. Wait just uh, one hour and uh, no problem. Okay, this is our way. Today you find a lot of uh, these instruments. And uh, okay, this was our first uh, ECC watch. And this is the last one. 
you see is a new <coughs> a new uh, tool which is able you see here the app to give you the electrocardiogram the spo2 values the oxygen in your blood the heart rate and the blood pressure all in this small watch with just one finger pushed in this point and nothing else. So this is our idea. But you can find also other instruments from commercial companies, okay? Okay, now the second item of this presentation is why artificial intelligence? Today, everybody is an expert of artificial intelligence. <laughs> this is not serious. Uh, I think to spend just two, two slides, no more, uh, just uh, showing you uh, what is really artificial intelligence. Uh, the term artificial intelligence came uh, in the 50s uh, by a group of United States scientists in California specifically, and uh, their idea was uh, to replace the human brain with uh, a an artificial brain <coughs> within 20 years. And uh, their first experience was very uh, exciting because uh, they found uh, some problems that were able to be solved using a new language, Prologue, and another new language, Lisp, that were able uh, to show a human-like behavior uh, about reasoning, uh, a lot of funds, okay? And uh, they were able uh, to, to go on with the research, but uh, in the 70s, uh, no results. And when you don't have uh, serious results, uh, your success is finishing. <laughs> so artificial intelligence seems to be cut off in the 70s. In the 80s, uh, uh, we have a, a new reborn with expert systems, and uh, again, <coughs> a new success, but uh, unfortunately, again, after a few years, uh, the collapse of the Lisp machine was the end of the original artificial intelligence. I call this a top-down approach, because uh, here we do not consider any morphological aspect of brain, neurons, synapses, nothing at all, only an approach to reasoning, top-down. In the same years, we have a, a different approach, a bottom-up approach called artificial neural networks, and uh, <coughs> it began in 1942, <coughs> when the two biologists, Mike Allog and Heath, created a mathematical model of a human neuron, of a human synapsis, uh, where we have a memory. And uh, this model was used to build uh, an artificial neural network, the perceptron. Okay, this uh, model was based on this artificial neuron. And again, this was another mistake. They were thinking to replace human brain. It's not so easy to replace human brain. I know that the human brain have a lot of uh, problems, but uh, uh, unfortunately, <coughs> it was not so easy. In the 90s, uh, I was working with Texas Instruments, and we developed an artificial neuron in silicon and an artificial synapsis in silicon. Uh, we patented them, and we built the first uh, integrated circuits. But the problem was that in our brain, we have uh, 10 to 11 neurons and 10 to 13 synapses. This huge number of connections and neurons and so on is still impossible to build in silicon. We are quite far from the <coughs> complexity of human brain. So again, this is not the right solution. And uh, for several years, uh, the research in neural networks uh, went on and uh, not with good results, good results. Uh, uh, now we have a new model, a new model called the Deep Neural Network, 
and uh, this is uh, is not intended to replace the brain. This is a good opportunity. We try only to replace some application, natural language processing, facial recognition, 3D structure of a protein, and other. <coughs> and uh, another important point is the availability today of cloud computing. Do you want to know an application of deep neural network? Alexa. Everybody, I think, has Alexa in his house. And when you say, Alexa, turn on the light, and the Alexa is able to understand you, to understand me, to understand my daughter, to understand everybody. Okay, this is a deep neural network, uh, able to understand the words and to work for some application. So, the innovation in this field is a deep learning. And the deep learning today is used for several healthcare applications. <laughs> and uh, this is really a big revolution in, uh, in severe interpretation because it's able to reproduce the human expert's interpretation behavior. Not replace brain, but for some application, yes. And uh, for example, for the first time, deep neural networks were able to capture the arterial activity and link it with ventricular activity. This is very important. And today, as I told you before, we are able, we are able, we are trying <laughs> to be able to forecast the Brugada affected patient's life expectation. You know that this is a serious uh, cardiological disease. And uh, a lot of people has Brugada, but Brugada can be good or not good. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, you die and uh, nobody knows why this is a problem. And uh, uh, we have an experience, unfortunately, with a few number of Brugada because uh, unfortunately or luckily, few person are dying for Brugada. So we, we have a few data to analyze. By the way, uh, in this last research, we had a 90% of success <coughs> in the trying to guess the life expectation of Brugada patients. Just to uh, show you why artificial intelligence can be important for this application. Uh, usually, we engineers, when we have a problem, we develop a model I studied for five years during my bachelor and master uh, in electronic engineer, how to develop a model and how to write an algorithm. And uh, this was the only way to solve problems. But uh, when I'm not able to create an algorithm, <laughs> difficult. Or sometimes uh, I'm able to create an algorithm, but it's too computationally expensive. I have to wait one week to have a solution, no good. And sometimes uh, the algorithm is not suitable for some inputs. So this is a classical approach. You have data, you have an algorithm, and you have answer. Artificial intelligence give you another opportunity. We don't have algorithm, we don't have model. <laughs> we have a model of an artificial neural network. And, uh, the procedure is machine learning. We have a general purpose machine learning, uh, not specifically an algorithm to solve our problem. A machine learning black box where we feed the input data and answer, and at the end, the machine learning is able to give you a solution. This is a really interesting, really powerful. The idea is that in traditional way, we have an electrocardiogram signal and we have a cardiologist, this is the brain of cardiologist, and he is able to catch information from electrocardiogram and to give you a diagnostic conclusion. But our idea is 
to replace the brain of a cardiologist with a deep neural network and to be able to give the same diagnostic conclusion. <coughs> These are deep neural networks. Uh, deep neural networks are quite a bit different from the machine learning that I showed you before. Uh, where is the difference? Uh, machine learning really uh, rely on uncrafted data sets. We work with cardiologists and we ask them to give us information about, uh, the, about uh, the characteristics of electrocardiogram. And uh, sometimes uh, humans uh, are not able to classify in the right way all this information. So machine learning is subjected to the human limitation. And the digital neural network can work on raw data without human interpretation, without feature extraction. They are able to self-extract these features, okay? This is uh, the, the new things. Of course, uh, every, every good thing has a cost. The cost here is that we need a huge number of data, <laughs> but it's natural. I think if we remain in ECZ, uh, a good cardiologist uh, in his long life is able to see thousands and thousands of electrocardiograms. If you think to use five electrogram, electrocardiograms to feed a deep neural network, you will have a poor results, just like a young uh, cardiologist uh, able to see only five electrocardiograms. So this is the problem, to have a huge number of uh, examples of data. Okay, uh, just to, to show you uh, a practical case, uh, the, the blood pressure. The blood pressure uh, was a bigger research where we used the uh, artificial neural networks to find a solution, an alternative solution to measure uh, blood pressure. Uh, the, the gold standard is to use an invasive blood pressure monitoring with an intra-arterial catheter, okay? This is used in ICU, of course. You need to cut your arm, to put a catheter inside your arterial. I think it's just a bit uh, invasive, okay? Uh, it's precise, okay? But uh, it's not the most common technique. Everybody knows that to measure his blood pressure, <laughs> you can uh, use sphygmomanometers. You find a lot of sphygmomanometers. Uh, an example is uh, a cuff, an inflatory cuff around your arm. A healthcare professional is able uh, to listen when uh, your cuff <laughs> is uh, completely inflated and to measure systolic and diastolic pressure. Our uh, sphygmo manometer are completely automatic, so they can uh, be self-consistent without our care professional. But you also have a very simple measurement blood pressure for wrist, and it's again a cuff on your wrist, automatic, and again you will measure your blood pressure. <clears throat> uh, this last method is uh, not precise because uh, it depends uh, on uh, the location, on uh, 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 the, the quantity of uh, inflection. You can't uh, work on this. So uh, sometimes uh, the value of your blood pressure are completely wrong. But also sphygmomanometer, uh, the best one, as an uh, error uh, is not so precise as this uh, first method. So uh, these are limitations of uh, sphygmo manometer and uh, automatic and not automatic. So we started just like engineers and we made a research about uh, mathematical models. 
we found two mathematical models uh, able to uh, estimate the blood pressure. First model is younger model, where uh, we were we are able to measure <coughs> the pulse wave with velocity, that is the speed of the blood pressure pulse traveling along your circulatory system. Oh, good idea. But have a look to the model. You need the thickness of the vessel. You need the blood densities. You need the diameter of your vessel, of your artery. And a lot of other parameters, okay. Very good, very precise model, but uh, really uh, impossible to apply to normal people without uh, a lot of invasive measurements. So we have another model due to FANGS where uh, we measure the pulse transit time, that is the time taken by the pressure waveform to propagate through the blood vessel. Okay, also here, you have a lot of parameter and uh, uh, related to the arterial blood and so on. So it's less invasive, but it's again quite complex. <laughs> and uh, the, the necessity to measure all these parameters <coughs> makes this model not precise. So mathematical models, no. Uh, invasive method, uh, no. Sphygmomanometer, not so precise. What can we do? Uh, have a look to artificial intelligence applied to electrocardiogram and photoplatismography, the oximetry, okay? Okay, here we, we have the, the two traditional approaches, the invasive method, the non-invasive method. This is uh, the idea uh, with uh, the small watch that I showed you before, we were able to take uh, in just 10 seconds, uh, both electrocardiogram and photopedismography. Uh, the electrocardiogram is a well-known measurement, but also photoplatismography is a well-known measurement. And uh, this method uh, allows to uh, find the blood pressure without any invasive signal. <coughs> How to validate this? <coughs> we use uh, the MIMIC database where uh, you find a lot of PPG and PCV, and uh, we use uh, the electrocardiogram and photoplatismography as inputs for a deep neural network without knowing nothing about feature. We didn't have to extract feature, okay? And uh, at the end of the target, we compared the results with. Uh, the uh, invasive method with a gold standard. And uh, just uh, to be fast and to give you an idea, if you think to spend the time using artificial intelligence to find this uh, applied to a database, remember that the real knowledge of artificial intelligence <coughs> is inside the data. So when you find a database, don't think the database is precise, is perfect. So you need to uh, work on the database and uh, uh, select the <coughs> right value of, uh, of electrocardiogram, petismography, and so on. We have a big database, but uh, not every data is correct. So sometimes you have uh, no inputs. So you have input for electrocardiogram and you miss the input for Okay, you have to think to this and to find a solution. Or sometimes uh, you have a not good electrocardiogram, you have a flat line and you have to find also this. <coughs> sometimes you have a very, strange signals, <coughs> not good electrocardiogram. So you have to remove 
and uh, apply filters because sometimes you have a noise on your signals and this can affect the precision of your blood pressure. Okay, and uh, in your database, you have a lot of data and you have to remove, we decided to remove a recording shorter than three hours to have a deep comprehension of the problem. And uh, at the end, we have to normalize the PPG, photopathismography, and the <coughs> arterial blood pressure. Okay, here you, you, you can see all the passages that we have to do. So this is a before <coughs> using artificial neural networks, deep neural networks, and so on. You can spend a lot of time to improve the quality of your data because here data are your main resources. Okay, now uh, we can use uh, these uh, systems, uh, checking uh, PPG and electrocardiogram and giving you the systolic and diastolic pressure. Let me show you. Okay, we don't have time to see every, everything. If you want, I will spend time in our occasion. And uh, let me show here a <coughs> measurement using uh, neural networks, uh, the error. Okay, we use the two different models giving you uh, the, the results for blood pressure after uh, taking values of ECC and PPG. Let me show just the conclusion of this research. Uh, we, we found a, a result with uh, an error uh, less than sphygmo manometer. Okay, so if we come back here, we see that uh, the error in our research with this network was uh, free. Uh, and uh, with the uh, sphygmo manometers, uh, we have an error of five. Okay, five is good. But here, without any inflating cuff, we have a, a better result. <laughs> and the same for this uh, uh, blood pressure. So the artificial neural networks uh, seems uh, to work uh, <coughs> with uh, this uh, data coming from the MIMIC database in a very good way, giving results uh, similar to the golden standard that we use in our vessel with intracatheter arterial system. But uh, in this second research, we use uh, nine healthy volunteers using uh, our uh, device, taking signals, and uh, we didn't have uh, the same uh, good results. We have good results, okay but the errors were higher than the case where we were able to train and test using the MIMIC database. So when numbers are <coughs> selected and not affected by errors, uh, the results are better because the data is the main resource for your deep neural network. And this is really important. So today's job is to improve the quality of data coming from real world. In the real world, <laughs> unfortunately, we have a lot of noise and uh, we have to find a new solution to filter noise from this data. Okay, these are some comments about different uh, neural network models. And this is, our last tool where you see that is again one finger, one touch instruments and a smartphone giving you all this uh, information. Uh, we found an important information that uh, uh, the neural network applied to this uh, uh, device <coughs> must be customized because every person has a different uh, behavior for blood pressure. So we start 
with one month of uh, trial and test in comparison with a golden standard to set up the neural network. Okay, uh, I see that it's uh, three o'clock. Uh, so I had another case, but uh, I think that uh, uh, it's uh, too late to show you. In this last case, we use image analysis with a neural network able to catch information from images. Okay, uh, I have no time to show you next time, maybe. And uh, it was a big success also this research. Now to finish, nothing is perfect. And uh, I showed you some uh, very good cases. Also the ulcer project had a big success. And uh, the problem is that uh, <coughs> some medical doctors reject artificial neural networks because they say they are black box and uh, they don't want to use black boxes instead of their brain. Okay, this is an idea. Uh, other medical doctors say, okay, we like artificial intelligence. We like to use these tools for some details of our <coughs> cases. And uh, as a uh, measurement society, we have to say that uh, today we still have to validate the precision and accuracy of these electronic sensors. Uh, we have uh, analog signals because uh, signals coming from a human body are analog signals and we have to convert it to digital to be transmitted using a smartphone. <laughs> Everybody knows that the transformation from analog to digital uh, has an error, a quantization error. And so we have to check this. Uh, <laughs> another uh, doubt that we have, everybody who works with uh, artificial neural networks knows that they are fantastic tools to guess numbers, uh, to, uh, uh, to generalize uh, the, the data that they have, for example, uh, when you use artificial neural networks to recognize uh, handwritten numbers, uh, neural networks are able to approximate the, the number two uh, also when uh, different people are <coughs> writing a different number two. But Alexa, Alexa is able to understand your voice, my voice, a lot of voices. So the, the powerful of neural networks is to generalize, but is this a good tool uh, to measure in a precise way signals? We have to evaluate. So just to finish, because uh, it's just one hour and one minute, uh, we can say that telemedicine uh, can use artificial intelligence to measure medical data in a different way. Maybe we have uh, we can overcome weak points of the traditional measures, think to electrocardiogram without address. <coughs> the results must be validated. Okay, we still have to work on this aspect to say, okay, artificial intelligence is good and the results are good. And the last but not the least, we still have to work on accuracy and the precision because uh, this is vital sign and uh, we needed to be uh, confident with this data okay thank you very much to everybody and uh, i hope to see no to listen to you again in the next time bye bye thank you dr passero there are two quick questions in um the question and answer feature. Can you open that and see the questions? Okay. Okay, uh, is it the question and answer? Zafar, 
Do we have a list of latest tools that revolutionary monitor health and what illness they monitor? <coughs> okay, Zafar, this is a very good question. And uh, the second question is again from Zafar, are they used for online monitoring? I have to say that uh, my last conclusion was that uh, today medical doctors are not completely confident with uh, artificial intelligence and electronic sensors to be used without the medical doctor in present. So uh, another problem is that these tools, these sensors should be FDA certified or in Europe CE certified. And it's not easy to obtain the FDA certification. So uh, I have to say uh, that uh, no uh, market tools uh, are today used uh, for uh, this application. I have a lot of uh, medical doctors working with my tools uh, and they accept this data. I mean, for example, uh, some years ago, uh, a medical doctor of a local health agency was using my ECG watch uh, on a patient and the patient, he, he was eight years old, called them saying, okay, I am not ill. Uh, well, I have some problem with my breath. And they suggested to put the finger on the ECG watch and to connect to the smartphone. And immediately they saw in the remote that he had an atrial fibrillation. But also myself, I have a classical case uh, two years ago, I was showing my device to students in my class, IT students, and uh, I show the ECZ coming from my watch, and uh, and uh, I show them. Okay, you can see here an atrial fibrillation. Oh yes, it's an atrial fibrillation, professor. But I was thinking, but this is my wrist. So this is my heart. I have another fibrillation. So the solution was to call my cardiologist to show the, uh, the ACC. And he told me, come here, come here. And after, uh, I don't say, I had a lot of problems. By the way, to respond to the last question, uh, for the doctors to act on the remote data is very any authentication process. Uh, this is a complex question. <laughs> because authentication process can be intended as FDA uh, compliance, and uh, uh, this is an important aspect. But this can be also intended as a, a authentication process, which can be uh, connect the, uh, the data to the patient. And uh, this is prohibited because uh, we need to respect uh, the the, the name of the patient, uh, not saying information about him. So this is a, a powerful question and we are still working about anonymous data for this. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, great. I think um, that's all the questions we have for today. So thank you so much, Dr. Passero. Thank you to everyone who attended this webinar. Um, it will be um, posted on the IMS website. So we encourage you to share it with any of your peers who may be interested. And okay. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody and uh, enjoy your time for this fantastic IEEE Educational Week. Bye.